I can eat his body weight in donuts. <laughs> oh, Lord. I saw him yesterday, and I thought, man, I got to get in the gym. All right? Good grief. I think I was that size coming out the womb, brother. I'm serious. So, Lord. <laughs> Dynamite comes in small packages, brother. And then I meet Pastor Brad. I, I, I met him at Strength of Stamina. I didn't remember what he looked like. So he meets me yesterday, and he was in, you know, just regular attire. And he looked like a 20-year-old in the lobby. I thought, oh, they got a cute little 20-year-old youth pastor. And I said, hey, I said, I did. I said, hey, kid, I said, how old are you? He goes, kid. He goes, man, I'm 45. I went, what? I said, where are all your gray hair? Um, uh, thank you guys for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here um, if you got your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and just, we're going to camp out um, in Ephesians chapter 2. But before we do that, um, if you came into the lobby and you saw that huge display there, that's us, Awaken International. Um, we just celebrated 25 years of ministry in July. We started this ministry in July 1994. That was the year I got out of the Navy, I'm sorry. Um, I was in the U.S. Navy. I was on submarines, believe it or not. <laughs> and, uh, and I got out in 94, and when I got out in 94, we started this ministry. And uh, so we just celebrated 25 years of our ministry, sharing the gospel, and also, aside of sharing the gospel, we have been fighting against trafficking also for those 25 years. So um, we're just humbled to see that that's gotten traction, and that unless you're living under a rock, you've heard about human trafficking, but in the, in the, early, in the late 80s, early 90s, um, when I started this, I could get not one church to back me in the early 90s. And I live in Atlanta, Georgia, by the way, which is number one in the U.S. for trafficking. But in the 90s, people just didn't think that existed in America, the quote-unquote Christian nation, right? So I could get no one to support me back then. I'm humbled now to see the traction that the, the world that's fighting against trafficking has taken. So um, if you got a heart for that or just seeing people come to know the Lord through the gospel, come meet me afterwards. Um, if you got your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 2, um, let me just go ahead and give a shout out to my wife and son. I have been married 16 years. Uh, my wife chased this chocolate man down. And, uh, and so um, my wife and I could not have children. So first of all, don't be praying for no miracle either, okay? We have a miracle. We adopted two precious little boys, and uh, I now have a six-year-old. I always told my wife I want our house to look like the international farmer's market because I like culture. So our first son, y'all, there ain't no, I can say this. I'll say it as a black man. There ain't nothing cuter than a little chocolate black baby. <laughs> he looked like a little chocolate marshmallow. My son, he's now six. Oh, he had a little afro. Oh, he was so gorgeous. And my second son, oh, ain't nothing cuter than a little white baby. That's right. I have a black son and a white son, and I'm, I'm thankful for both. And so my, my white son's now four, my black son's six. And, um, and so I told my wife, I'm just waiting on some mixed babies and some, some Latin babies. I just love culture and I love people because I think it shows the beauty of God and his creativity. And, uh, and so I want my house to have every nation in it you can think of. And, uh, and so God's, God's got us on our way. So keep us in prayer. My wife just had a surgery a couple months ago. She had a double mastectomy. And, uh, and then she's having a hysterectomy. You ladies understand all this stuff. And she's in her early 40s, and she's about to start an, an uh, early menopause. So pray for her and pray for me. And because um, we have a four-year-old and a six-year-old, and I'm a 46-year-old man chasing a four-year-old around. It doesn't look pretty at times. So now my wife's about to start menopause. She said, tell them to pray for you because it might be rough in the house for a while. And, uh, and so on that note, let's just dig in the word. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to lay a foundation here so you understand where we're going. This is what we call one of the four prison epistles that was written by Apostle Paul. So he, he was in Ephesus for two years with this church. He later leaves. Uh, all of a sudden he gets wind of things in the church. He wants to write to encourage them. Y'all, when Paul writes his letters, you'll notice he never sounds like a man who's in bondage. This guy sounds like he's on a cruise ship clogging his arteries. But he's in prison. And so they throw him in prison. He goes to prison, and the guy starts a prison ministry. What can you do to this guy? They're like, if you keep preaching about Jesus, we're going to throw you in prison. He's like, look, man, y'all sure you want to do that? Because God might do something crazy up in this prison. Surely these guys need the gospel. So he's thrown in prison four times for sharing the gospel. And every single time, God does amazing things. 
amazing things. And I wanted this message to encourage everyone here, no matter where you are, if you're seeking, you don't quite understand faith, if you've been in the church and you're a new Christian or you're a seasoned one, I promise you there's nothing like Paul's letters to reach all of us where we are. Here this guy is, thrown in prison. Y'all, we're laying a foundation. Write some of these things down if you can't listen. He was in physical chains, but he was not in spiritual chains. The greatest bondage a person can be in isn't physical. It's spiritual. Even though they threw him in prison, he was still in there leading people to Christ, and he had joy, and God was using him. And if you notice, he was the founder of this church. He could have easily gotten the congregation riled up in their emotions. How dare they throw me, the founder, the pastor of the church in prison. He never once even asked for God to set him free because he realized he was already free because he had Jesus. See, we were talking about it this morning when they were practicing um, for worship. I said, guys, you know, Christianity is most effective when it costs you the most to live for it. That's why we love to talk about Christians in Egypt and China and, 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 and Arabic countries. Why? Because we know it's costing them so much to live for Jesus. But what are, we're in an air-conditioned building right now. <laughs> so it's easier for us. And Paul, Paul was the one to, to set that thing. He was saying, look, I've been thrown in prison for preaching the gospel, but he never once prayed for karma. Lord, let my oppressors get what's coming to them. You'll watch and see how he talks. He's in prison, but you would think that he had this amazing love for even those who were oppressing him. Why? If you don't have any church background, I'm giving you this real quick so we can dig through these scriptures. Apostle Paul once persecuted the church. That means he had gave the order to have Christians killed. My hero is a guy in the Bible named Stephen. He was one of the very first early evangelists of the, of the church. Apostle Paul gave the commands to have this guy killed. People say, what's the equivalent today? There is no equivalent, but it'd be like, say Pastor Brad was like, I'm like, hey, man, what'd you do before you came to the ministry? He's like, well, I killed Billy Graham. I'm like, what? You killed Billy? You're going to jail. And so Stephen was like the Billy Graham of his era. He was this amazing evangelist. And Apostle Paul, in his zeal, kills this early saint in the church. Now, how do you go from a guy who's killing Christians to a guy who's in prison because he's wanting to bring people into a relationship with Christ? That meant somewhere in there he experienced God, and somewhere in there he had to get all the guilt and shame for all the shady things he did before he came to the Lord. Because you can't go from persecuting Christians to being thrown in prison because of Christianity if you haven't had a radical change in there. Because I'm sure Satan would bring guilt and say, look at all the stuff you've done Dude, you had Christians killed, and now you're probably the greatest Christian that's ever walked the planet. How do you get there? Oh, I'm glad you asked. So if you got your Bibles, let's go to Ephesians um, chapter 2, and I'm going to have four points here, and then we will be done. The biggest part is laying the foundation. Listen to what he says here. Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. He says, Oh, is it gonna be? Oh, here we go. He goes, and you were dead in the trespasses and sin. He's writing this to the church, y'all. Listen to this. Oh, this is so good. Pastor, this is better than hot Krispy Kremes, I promise you. He said that you were dead. Go back, go back, go back, go back. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. He's writing this to the church. So what's he doing? He's reminding them because this church was growing. He was, he was encouraging them to stay in community, to grow in your faith, to grow in holiness. But Paul also knew with that can come some legalism. It's, I have, if you're here and you're lost, I have no problem if you think we're crazy. <laughs> because I thought Christians were crazy too before I got saved. And I still think they are at times. But listen to this. He goes, we were all into sin. He's reminding the church that, yes, God has changed you and radically changed you. But those people that you want karma to happen to, Christians believe in grace, not karma. Karma is saying, I hope you get a taste of what you've given me. Christians go, no, I actually, even to my oppressors, I pray that God is merciful and gracious to you. I pray that you don't get what's coming to you. I pray that you get some grace and some mercy. So here he is. Can I walk? Can I walk? Oh, man, now we're about to have church now. I hope this mic, I'm sorry if it goes off, but listen, he's reminding the church of this. He goes, you were once dead. See, the, the scriptures will always make you focus on you. Christianity will destroy an entitlement mentality. It'll make you quit blaming everybody else for what you're not. He goes, you were once, he's talking to the church. This ain't an evangelistic thing. He was, he was writing letters to the church. 
He goes, you were once dead in your trespasses and sin. That's his way of saying, remember, those very people that you may want God to strike down, you were those very people. And sometimes when you grow in your faith and you grow in the Lord, you begin to walk in holiness and change. We can forget that those very people we despise, we were once them. Everybody always wants God to pour out his wrath. It's because they think they're already saved. So everybody wants to fly away. I fly away, oh glory. That's sweet. But I ain't ready to fly away. I still got a lot of friends who are lost. And it's a selfish mentality for us to want God to pour out his wrath. when All he did was pour out his mercy. And so Paul's reminding the church, you were not, there is no genetic trait for Christianity. You can't say, well, I'm a Christian because my grandmother was. It's not something you're born into, but Paul said, I can tell you what you are born into. You are born into sin, every one of us. It's the one thing that puts us all on the level playing field. You may be in here and you're a great businessman. You may do yoga and drink green smoothies and look cute. You may be on the football team. You may have a college degree. You may have a great marriage and sweet kids who obey you, which, praise the Lord, yours does. But the one thing in here you were absolutely horrible at, and that was conquering sin. You may be awesome, wealthy, handsome, good-looking, beautiful, but I can tell you something that you royally stink at, and that is conquering sin. So right when we think we got something over another person, our looks, our parents, our house, our wives, our children, our stuff, the one thing that God can just humble us all down and bring us to the same level is sin. <laughs> it's the one thing that nobody hears that awesome that you could beat it on your own. See, it brings more attention to God, not when I love people who agree with me. You're Christian and conservative. No. When it says love your neighbor, that literally means even those you disagree with. Now, that brings more attention to God. It's easy for me to love people who believe in Jesus, vote the way I do, think the way I do. But what about the neighbor who's everything that I am not? Now, for me to love that person, it brings more attention to God. And it shows that I remember that I, too, was a man born into sin. And that that person needs mercy and grace the same way I did. So, obviously, the first point here... <laughs> is that we are dead in our sins. And that word dead is nikros in Greek. It literally means a corpse. It doesn't mean you're drowning in sin. You were dead in it. Jesus doesn't just take people who are drowning and bring them and save them. He takes dead people. You have completely dead in sin. You're powerless to rescue yourself. Y'all hear me. If you're in here and you think that bothers you, there's no more beautiful thing because if we're all honest in our core, we know there ain't no leave it to beaver marriages in here. If we're all honest to our core, then we all fight selfishness. We all fight insecurities. Are you kidding? We all do. Every single one of us. If we're honest, we all know that deep inside none of us feels like we're enough. Are you kidding? I battle with it all the time. And I'm preaching all over the world, pastor, and I still have to battle with, am I enough? Because at the end of the year, all these ministries that use me will send me out their end of the year letter. And this guy's like, hey, brother, praise the Lord. We led 20,000 people to Jesus. You don't think I start feeling insecure? Like, am I enough? And I had to consistently remind myself that I was never enough. That's what makes it beautiful. Jesus was enough. And because I wasn't enough and he was enough, I can be enough because he took my place. My confidence isn't that I think I'm awesome. My confidence is that God loved me it says, even when I was in sin. That means when you were your most shady, <laughs> that's when God gave you his best. He ain't wait for you to start going to church, going to Sunday school, reading your Bible, and loving your wife and children. <laughs> when the last thing you thought about was Jesus is when he offered you his best. American culture would say that is ridiculous. Who gives their enemies and, and their oppressors and who loves those people? I'm going, Jesus does. And because he did it, Paul's reminding them, see, that you're helpless to help yourself. And he's reminding them of this. Let's keep going. Let's keep going to down to the next couple of verses. He goes, and once you once walked, following the patterns of this world, notice he said, once you once walked. <laughs> so if there was anybody there who thought they were awesome, man, God's changed me. I'm leading Sunday school. I'm leading a home group. I'm awesome. I'm like, we quote scriptures. We do devotions. Paul said, oh, remember, you once walked in this too. See, there's a passage in the Bible in Romans 13, 8. It's my favorite passage. It says, owe no man anything except to love him. 
It never says they even have to be lovable or likable. God put all the responsibility on how I treat others on me, never on you. Come on, man, did y'all get that? <laughs> so, man, according to the scriptures, no matter what you think about me, if you don't like me this morning, if you don't like that I'm tall or beautifully chocolate or my accent or whatever, Christians don't have a mandate to hate our enemies. But God says the more they hate you, the more he actually commands me to love them. That's the beauty of Christianity. Romans 13, 8 says, Oh, no man anything but to love him. So according to that passage, Paul is saying the only debt a Christian can never repay is called love. That one you will always be giving people until the day you die. That's a debt you'll never fully pay. And that's why I love Paul always brings it back to you because it's easy to say, well, it was my parents' fault, it's the staff's fault, it's the pastor's fault, my wife's fault, my children, my boss. We can spend our whole lives saying, well, God, we believe you can save our soul but you can't give me any joy. I believe you can save my soul, but you can't help my marriage. I believe you can save my soul, but you can't help me overcome people who've wounded me. If you are a Christian, God's already given you the greatest thing he can ever give you. He can never top giving you Jesus. And if you believe he gave you Jesus, then how is it that he can save your soul from hell, but he can't help you pay your bills? He saved your soul from hell, but he can't help you forgive someone that's wounded you. He's already done the greatest thing for you already. That, that's why some of you keep wondering, well, why ain't God answering my prayers? But he is answering your prayers because every one of your prayers is self-centered. Help my business, my church, my finances, my body, my health, my children. God's going, the reason I can't answer that is because it's all self-centered. And if I, if I give you everything you ask for, what makes you think you're going to serve me with it when you can't serve me with the little you got now? If you're being self-centered with a little and your prayers are always, give me more, give me a raise, a better car, a better house, a better body, God's going, but you're not even giving me that thing right there that you don't think's enough. You haven't even given that to me yet. So a lot of times God doesn't answer the prayer, but it isn't because he's big, mean God. It's because everything we're asking for is self-centered. It's always about us. When's the last time we've lost some sleep because somebody else's marriage wasn't as blessed as ours? Or they didn't have a home the way we do, or live the way we do, or is blessed? Rarely do we lose sleep if the neighbor's hurting. Who cares? As long as I'm taking care of, life's good. And see, Christianity, brother, and man, please don't run me out of here, y'all, please. I'm, I'm trying to be respectful, but hear me. Christianity is most effective when it's least about you. That's why he doesn't say to you to make them more selfish. He's saying to you to show them you're thinking too much of you. You once walked in this. You really want to find freedom in Christ? Just learn to owe people nothing but to love them. So that means even when they rub you wrong, y'all disagree, they don't do everything you like, it won't cause you to isolate them because you weren't ever loving them because of who they were. You were loving them because of who their maker was. Come on, man, do y'all get that? Because if you're loving people based on how you think they should treat you, respect you, they ever disrespect you, you go. You know it's true. They ever disagree with you, you go, I can't believe they didn't agree with me. I'm awesome. And then instantly you're going to stop loving them because it was your conditional love and not God's unconditional love. Because you didn't bring anything to the table but sin. And God says, I'll trade you. All your sin, shadiness, folly. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to give you Jesus. Hold on. So all I can give you is, is my, my rubbish and my garbage and my trash, and you give me this priceless treasure. I had nothing that was worth value to bring to God, and yet he gave me a, this priceless, valuable treasure in his son. How can I ever repay him for that? So I don't, people say, man, how do you make your marriage successful? My marriage began to get well. We struggled for a while, y'all. Don't think my marriage is awesome. We had about eight years. Oh, it was rough. People say, when did you turn the corner when I quit having expectations of my wife? People say, what? I say, if she cleaned, great. If the if food was cooked, great. But if not, I was going to cook, clean up. How, I had no expectations of her. So now she was free to love me because she knew if, if the kids were driving her crazy, she didn't have to clean the house and cook. She knew, baby, no matter what you do, I'm not loving you because of what you do. I'm loving you because of who your God is. So now she actually had freedom to really love me and, and grow in Christ when I quit having expectations. I have zero expectations in my marriage, none, none. If it's done, great. If not, because if I have expectations, she doesn't meet them, we're going to have some problems. 
But if my expectation is, but see, here's the, here's the good thing is, they usually meet your expectations when you're not pressuring them with the expectations. When you're just loving them unconditionally, now they want to do that stuff for you. It's amazing how the Lord works. So Paul's saying, look, uh, you used to follow the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. That word literally means influence. The prince of the power of the air. So Satan does have some power, but it typically means influence. He's more powerful than God. Come on, did y'all hear me this morning? <laughs> He's not more powerful than our Lord, but he does have some power. He can influence people. And that's just as powerful as real power. If somebody can convince you they're powerful, they're powerful. God has no true foe, no enemy, because to say he has a true foe is to say there's a chance someone can overthrow him. They're only a foe in the sense that they oppose him, not that they're a threat. <laughs> Does that make sense? Satan's a foe because he opposes him, but he ain't a foe because he could ever overthrow God. So he's saying, look, but Satan has influence. Don't play around with that. That's Paul's way of saying what goes in you and affects you. Don't over-spiritualize and think, no, it doesn't. Why do you think we preachers hammer y'all so much about staying in the Word? Because Paul understood the only way to change your behavior is to change your thinking. If you think the same, you'll keep doing the same. Satan influences, most of the time he influences your thoughts well before your actions follow. Every sin begins with the thought. If you don't think something, you don't do it. That's why he says power of the air. That's when he starts influencing your mind. What you believe, what you learn in academia, all of those things begin to shape you. You don't believe me? Go and see how I do apologetics. Go see how hard it is to lead someone to Christ on a college campus because they're so convinced that their academia is too deep to be Christians. It's their mind. It's not their behavior. It's everything they've learned in their mind that convinced them they're smarter than God. They've been influenced by the one, the prince of the power of the air. He knows that I can get people to do a lot of things if I can get them to believe it. If you want to change what you're doing, you have to change how you're thinking. That's why Apostle Paul says you're changed by the renewing of your minds. If you don't change this by the word, you're going to keep doing the same things, and we call that insanity. You keep doing the same things, wondering, why is my life changing? And you keep hammering us preaching. Going, Every time that preacher preaches, he's always telling me I need to be in the Bible. We need to say it ten times more than we ever do. You need to stay connected in the word because what goes in you will eventually come out of you. <laughs> he says Satan has influence. He goes, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, keep going, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Notice he said we all did. We all chased passions. That means things that feel good to your senses. He goes, nobody in here was born so moral and so pure that you didn't have to fight passions. And y'all know it's true. When my wife and I were, were courting each other, she, used to, she doesn't anymore. She used to read romance novels. And I said, hold on, babe. Y'all be getting on guys for watching inappropriate stuff. I said, every book I see, there's some handsome guy. His shirt's, his shirt's buttoned down. He's been working out at Gold's Gym all day. He's got long hair. He's blowing in the wind. They're floating down the river together. He's got a rose in his mouth speaking to her in French. And I told my wife, okay. I said, but what, they, what are they going to do when that boat quits floating down the river? Does he have a job? Because I said, babe, there are many good-looking guys who are broke. I tell people it's amazing how attractive my gut looks to my wife when the bills are paid. <laughs> I see many good-looking brothers be single because they're too busy looking at themselves in the mirror. <laughs> Point number two. <laughs> it says God chose to show us mercy rather than wrath and pouring out his wrath on his son, Jesus Christ. Go to verse three and I'll show you this. Listen to this. <laughs> this is really good. He goes, Amongst all we only, he goes, they were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Keep going. Verse four. But God being what? Rich in what? But see, I got to lay a foundation so y'all can get this. What Paul is saying, he goes, y'all were all born children of wrath. That is his way of saying God had every right, every right to condemn all of mankind. It was well within his rights. He's God. He demands holiness and perfection. He goes, he, that's what we were all born deserving. You were all born. He's reminding the church, you weren't born a sanctified child of God. 
You were born an enemy of God, an enemy of the cross. God could have just destroyed all of us. But instead, God being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he had. Notice the verse before that said he poured out his wrath. How can he pour out wrath and be merciful? You're, you didn't get his wrath. Jesus did. You were the one that he was rich in mercy toward. Jesus got his wrath. You got his mercy. So the next time you want to think you're better than your, your co-workers, you're better than some of your crazy family members, <laughs> I'm more spiritual than that church member, I'm more spiritual than that staff member, and you begin to teach your horn and think you're awesome. Paul says, remember, you were born a child of wrath too. In all of your holiness and righteousness and spirituality, on your best day, your righteousness was like filthy rags compared to Jesus. And y'all don't want to go into what that word means. Go and study what filthy rags there means. And it's gruesome to talk about in church, but it's literally what it meant, ladies, because it was a different time back then, but they still had their cycle. And he compares your best day to that. So when you see that, it's kind of hard to go around thinking I'm awesome because maybe I know a few more passages of scriptures than someone else. I'm still reminded in my core, all I was was an enemy of God. And I was deserving of his punishment. But instead, he poured it out on my sweet Savior. That alone sometimes makes me love people past their behavior. It makes me go, Lord, help me love them, not based on their likability, but based on the fact that you gave your life for them, you shed your blood for them. And that gets me past all these conditions that I think I have on people before I can love them. Do they agree with me? Are they racist? Are they conservative? Are they Christian? It gets me past all of those things and go, Lord, it doesn't matter. You're pretty good at being God. Two things in life are true. One, there's a God. Two, it ain't you. <laughs> God's pretty good at being God, and we need to be pretty good at just being his servants. He said, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. That means when my son asked me, he always does, my six, daddy, what are you going to do? I say, son, I'm a professional servant. Now, I have family members that struggle with me saying that as a, as a black American. I don't care what they think. Yeah, y'all heard me say it. <laughs> they didn't die for me. I have no problem saying that all I'm called to do is be a lead servant. I have no purpose apart from you. So if you're here this morning and you think we got all these rules, you got to be perfect, you're so deceived. I don't have a reason to wake up in the morning if people are perfect. So imperfect people actually give me hope. Not that I'm rejoicing in your struggles, but it gives me hope that there's always someone that needs help. Come on, man, are y'all hearing me, Pastor? The next time you run into a Christian pastor that comes to your office and say, I'm bored with Christianity, that counseling session's over. Because all that fool is saying is I'm self-centered. Because every time I look around, there's somebody's marriage that's struggling. Somebody that's dealing with cancer and breast cancer and sickness. And, and I've, I've seen, we've seen a couple young ladies the past couple years that lost their babies to this thing called SIDS. There ain't nothing more cruel, y'all. I've seen so much hurt around me. I ain't got time to be bored. Let me a Christian who can say they're bored. That means you're a little self-centered thing. You might not even be saved. I mean, you thought it was all about you. We have the most exciting faith in the world. Why? Because there are always needs on every corner. And the only people who are bored with Christianity are the people that, that really don't want a relationship with a God. They want a genie. And if that's the case, go watch Aladdin. Most people don't want God. They just want what he can give them. That's, that means you just want a, a well wisher. You just want a God to grant you some wishes. And God is saying, a lot of you will begin to enjoy Christianity more if you quit thinking about you all the time. He's not a bad God who's playing hide and seek with you. God is saying, I'm there to be found. We may not like it, y'all, but it's horrible theology to say, I love Jesus, I just don't like people. That's horrible theology, by the way. So if you're here this morning, you're going, man, if that preacher really knew me, I'm going, yeah, if you really knew me. But God really does know me, and yet he still loves me. He knows how messed up I am to the core. And he was still willing to give the greatest thing he had his son for me. So what are you going to convince me of in this room this morning that makes you unlovable? Is if you got the one sin that Jesus' blood can't cover. I don't care what you think about you. I know a God who valued you above everything, that he gave everything to purchase you. 
So even if you're here this morning, you don't know me, preacher. I've been divorced. I cheated on my spouse. My business failed. I haven't been a great father, a great mother, a great pastor, a great whatever. Join the club. We all feel that. But I'm here, I'm here to still tell you Jesus is greater than our failures, our shortcomings, and his love is greater than all of those things. Listen, this is Paul reminding. Keep going, my friend. Keep going. He goes, now, listen, don't go back to the verse. He goes, by which he loved us. He gave us mercy, but he tells you what the mercy, what was the root of the mercy was love. It wasn't hate. <laughs> the root of the mercy was love. And then he says this, even when we are, he mentions to them again, so they get it. Even when you were dead in your trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. That's Paul's way of saying he didn't wait for you to get saved before he started loving you. So who are you to pass judgment on these people who don't look like you, believe like you? He says, remember, you were once dead too. Y'all know these sermons don't preach because we all want to hear God's just going to bless us and stick it to everybody that's hurt us. And, and he was saying, no, you were once dead and you were, he reminds them again, but you were made alive together with Christ. But Christ had to die so you could be made alive. So quit cheapening grace by saying, well, it's a free gift. It's very easy. No, it, it was a costly gift and it is free, but it cost Jesus everything to redeem us. So the next time I think there's conditions, I remind myself that all I had to offer God was my sin. I was an enemy, and still, yet he loved me. So the next time my family or anybody tries to tell me these people aren't lovable, I'm reminded that I didn't think I was lovable either. But somehow God gave everything for me when I wasn't looking for him. Or otherwise, you better hear me, I keep echoing it, otherwise you're going to love people conditionally, and that's going to hurt Christian community. Because anybody you're going to do community with, you're going to eventually rub. You're going to disagree. We're going to have some frictions. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I love my staff. Y'all don't think we want to have some knockdown arguments? But they know they're not going to get booted just because they disagree with me either. Or they know that we're not going to talk to each other. It's called life because we're looking at each other beyond the natural. Matter of fact, listen to this. Write this down, your third point, and then we're almost done. Yeah, we're a great time, too. He goes, we can only be saved by grace. And I'm going to show you this. What is grace? It's God's loving favor toward us and not making us pay for our own sins. When we say unmerited favor, this is what we're talking about. It's like it's his favor towards you when he should drop the gavel and let you, you get. The next time you start praying for justice, be careful, <laughs> Be careful. The next time you hear somebody say, well, it should have been me that died on the cross. That stuff sounds sweet, but that's horrible. If you died on the cross, we'd all go to hell. There ain't nothing spiritual about you. Doesn't that sound sweet, though, around Easter? If I say, oh, brother, it should have been me on the cross. I'm like, no, it shouldn't. The Bible are you reading? I'm like, as horrible as it is, thank God it was Jesus that died on that cross. Because it was the only redemption any of us had. So I'm not trying to grow uh, an Alabama American. <laughs> I'm trying to grow saints who will love people through this lens. Because the greatest form of evangelism, isn't y'all inviting an evangelist to preach the gospel? It's me growing the church and helping Christians get passionate about who God is. One can reach a thousand, two, ten thousand. God will never make his glory about one man. Come on, man. Do y'all get that? Pastor, I love you guys. I love y'all. But if this church can't survive beyond these pastors, then y'all aren't a healthy church because you put your faith in men and not in God. The lead pastor is Jesus. The lead evangelist is Jesus. I said to my wife and staff, if I ever get away from this, don't follow me. <laughs> he is the ultimate authority. If I ever, you ever see me not loving people the way he said, rebuke me, but it has to be his way. This is it. This is the only way human beings will ever fully love each other is for us to see each other through the lens of the maker. We may tolerate each other, but God hadn't called me to tolerate you. He's called me to love my neighbor. And love means you'll lay down your life for someone. I can only do that if I've had a supernatural encounter with God because my natural nature is justice, revenge, look after me. The only way we can love people, a guy in prison, by the way, in prison, is writing to the church telling them, remember to stay the course, love people, walk by faith, do community, always live in grace, always be gracious while he's in prison. He never wants pastor is screaming out for justice right here. Please let those who, and you'll notice he never once says, pray God's wrath on those who threw me in prison. He never once even mentions his accusers. 
All he does is focus on the church, what your responsibility is. Come on, y'all. It's too easy for us to get caught up in things. It's too easy for you to blame politics and the mayor and the governor and the president, and you lose sight of what God's called you to do. It's so easy for us to pass the buck and blame Obama, Trump, everybody else, and God's saying, how are they keeping you from cutting your neighbor's grass? That's because you're lazy. How, how are they keeping you from paying your neighbor's bills? That's because you're stingy. So Paul's reminding them, God's given us all a responsibility, and nobody can stop God's will in our lives but us. So hear me this morning. Your biggest enemy will always be you. I know that don't preach, y'all. Nobody will ever hurt you like you will hurt you if you don't have a right understanding of who you are in Christ. Then you, you won't be like Paul. Even though he was in physical bondage, he never once asked God to release some of the chains because that brother was free. And when you're free in Christ, the physical doesn't take your joy away. It's just prolonging what's to come. Amen? Come on, I got one more, one more point, and we, and we will be done here. Yes, Lord, thank you for this time. This is great. Let's keep going. Uh, let's keep going to the next verse. Hey, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Keep going. So that in the coming ages, he might show his immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us. And Jesus Christ says that he did all of this. He showed you mercy and stuff to show his kindness. Matter of fact, the Bible goes on to say it's the goodness of the Lord that leads people to what? Repentance. It never says it says wrath. Read scripture in context. He goes, Yes, people know in their hearts of heart God can wipe all of it out, but why doesn't he? The next time somebody says to you, Jesus looks weak, I get it all the time on university. They go, Christianity looks so weak. The one guy said to me, at least the Muslims can take out their enemies. And he said, what are you Christians going to do, take them out to Starbucks? I said, yes. But he was mocking me. And I said, I said, which is more powerful, for me to hit you in the mouth right now or for me to hug your neck? He said, uh, I said, come on, answer. Because if you think it's more nice, I'll hit you in your face right now. I'm a big old man, too. Get some, I can get some power behind it. I said, so I think it shows God's power because he could, he could pour out his wrath, but he chooses to keep pouring out his mercy. He's slow to anger. It takes a whole lot more strength for a man to withhold anger than him to show it. Anger's natural for me, but grace doesn't come natural. <laughs> mercy is not natural. He says, God did all this to show his kindness. Keep going, keep going. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. Keep going, why? So that, so that no one may what? Boast. If, if you didn't do anything, if you didn't lift a pinky finger to save yourself, then you shouldn't be going around boasting about it. Matter of fact, the longer you walk with Christ, actually the more humble it should make you. Because a young believer, they're just excited not to go to hell. <laughs> But when you're mature and you walk with God, you see all the things he kept you from. He's provided for you. He's given you children. Some of you grandkids. Some of you maybe great grandkids. No teenager should have more joy than, than someone here old enough to be their parents. Because we've seen God's provision over time. We've seen it. So that's why we don't boast in us. Because you saw those times where you're like, honey, how are we going to pay this bill? How are we going to deal with this? And here you stand today taken care of. Because you've seen God's provision. Keep going. I'm almost done. My last verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God pre prepared beforehand that we should what? Walk in them. This is my, yo, listen to this. My last point. Here's my last point. Oh, this is so good. <laughs> he goes, I'm going, we're saved to show, to show God's goodness because ultimately it's his goodness that leads people to Christ. But how does he do it? It says workmanship. That word literally means in the Greek masterpiece. That ain't something you're going to get from the dollar store, y'all. Sorry. <laughs> if you got an expensive um, piece of art in your house, you want it when people first walk in, you want them to see the nice stuff. Not the, not the Elmo, you know, thing you bought from Walmart. <laughs> and he's saying, look, not only were you born into sin, you were deserving of wrath, but you didn't get it. Jesus took it on. Not only does God save you to just not go to hell, but he saves you to make you the masterpiece that he's going to show off. He doesn't just save his enemies. He shows them off later after he's redeemed them. So here you are, born an enemy. He not only saves you, he's going to also parade you as a masterpiece. You're his workmanship. Lord, we should be happy with just not going to hell. And he said, no, 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 I love you way more than that. 
I didn't just save you so you wouldn't be in the flames. I saved you so that you could come back into this beautiful relationship with me so I could put you on display. Because workmanship means you're working at it. He was saying, it's work, but the work is beautiful when it's finished. And that's you, whether you believe it about yourself or not. He said, if you will give yourself to me, the finished work will be a beautiful masterpiece that I will paint for my glory. And I will use this life that used to cause people pain. I will actually use your life to bring people hope and redemption and mercy. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, we love you.